Hello, friends, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather. I am a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being much more in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 222, I think. Um, I really should look that up before I start to talk. Uh, I, I think that's where we're at. And it's on Edmund Spencer and the Fairy Queen. I've been doing a couple of episodes this past month on writers. We did Amelia Lanier. We did Philip Sidney. And, you know, you kind of start to go down these rabbit holes and it turned into a rabbit hole of writers. In February, we're going to do a rabbit hole of love. We're going to talk about relationships. I did a fun anti-Valentine's Day episode a couple of years ago that was inspired by Lady Gaga's bad romance. And it was bad Tudor romance. And it was like the worst breakups in Tudor history and the worst husbands and, and uh, relationships. But this month in February, all of the episodes are going to be on sweethearts and lovers and all things heart-shaped. And also Galentines and some of the best female friendships as well, because those female relationships have always been of the utmost importance in history as well. Um, all right. But this episode, we're talking about Edmund Spencer and the Fairy Queen. I want to thank my newest patrons and YouTube members. Patrons and YouTube members get extra episodes. They get extra chats uh, this week or next week. We're having a patron only chat with Brigitte Webster, who wrote Cooking with the Tutors. Uh, they also get extra little mini courses, depending on what level they're at. They get all kinds of extra fun goodies. So thank you so much to my newest patrons, Kim. We've also got Carrie, France, Jackie, Gretchen, uh, Ursula, Margaret and Christina. And then we also have over on YouTube, Danny. Hi, Danny. Jennifer, Alexandra, Edith, Catherine, the fabulous Teresa, Tiffany, Cindy, and Leanne. So thank you so much, my dear friends, for joining and being part of this community. You can join this group of folks and get extra episodes, extra content, extra community chats, discounts at my shop, uh, TutorCon streaming tickets, all of that by either going to patreon.com slash englandcast or if you are listening to this on youtube you can just go ahead and click the join this channel button it makes it super duper easy so again patreon.com slash englandcast or just click join this channel all right thank you so much my friends let us get into it today like i said we are looking at edmund spencer a luminary of english literature spencer was born around 1552 and he is best remembered for his epic poem the fairy queen a rich tapestry of fantasy allegory and political commentary woven to celebrate the tudor dynasty and elizabeth the first this monumental work famed for its unique spencerian stanza is not just a cornerstone of English literature, but also a reflection of the vibrant and complex period of Tudor England. Its influence extends far beyond its immediate historical context, shaping the very fabric of the English language and literature as we know it. So Edmund Spencer was born in East Smithfield, London, around 1552. He was born into a time of political intrigue and cultural blossoming, Spencer's early years were steeped in the vibrant atmosphere of a city at the heart of a nation undergoing profound transformation. He was educated at the Merchant Taylor School, a place that nurtured his young, inquisitive mind, setting the stage for his future literary endeavors. His intellectual journey took a significant turn when he matriculated as a sizar, a student receiving financial assistance, at Pembroke College, Cambridgeshire. There, he not only received a comprehensive education, but also formed a lifelong friendship with Gabriel Harvey, a fellow scholar. This friendship was marked by spirited intellectual exchanges, shaping Spencer's literary sensibilities. Despite their differing views on poetry, Harvey's influence on Spencer was profound, fostering an environment of critical thinking and creativity. Post-Cambridge, Spencer briefly served as a secretary to John Young, Bishop of Rochester, 
marking the start of his career. This role was short-lived, but it was a stepping stone that introduced him to the world of courtly politics and ecclesiastical affairs, themes that would later permeate his literary works. 1579 was a pivotal year for Spencer. He published The Shepherd's Calendar, an innovative work that won him considerable acclaim. Around the same time, he married a woman called Maccabeus Child, and their union brought two children, Sylvanus and Catherine, anchoring Spencer's personal life amidst his rising literary career. Spencer's connection with Ireland began in July 1580 when he accompanied Arthur Gray, the 14th Baron Gray de Wilton, the newly appointed Lord Deputy of Ireland. His time in Ireland was transformative, not just in his professional life, but also in his worldview. Ireland's turbulent political landscape and its cultural richness deeply impacted Spencer, influencing his later writings. He settled at Kilcolman near Donrail in North Cork, a place that would become a significant backdrop for his literary pursuits. The serene landscape of Kilcolman with its sprawling estate and the legendary Spencer's Oak provided the perfect milieu for the poet's imagination to flourish. Spencer's time in Ireland was not just about literary creation, it was also about building a life. He acquired land, engaged in local socio-political dynamics, and by 1594, when his wife had died, we don't know exactly when she died, but she had died by 1594, because that is when he married Elizabeth Boyle, a union celebrated in his sonnet sequence, Amoretti. His life in Ireland was a tapestry of personal and professional triumphs and challenges, all of which fed into the depth and complexity of his later works, including the magnum opus, The Fairy Queen. The Fairy Queen is one of those pieces that have cast a long shadow throughout English literature. First published in 1590, this epic poem was a bold tapestry of allegory, romance, and political commentary exquisitely woven to glorify the Tudor monarchy and particularly Queen Elizabeth I. The poem, celebrated for its elaborate and inventive language, stood as a testament to Spencer's mastery over verse and his commitment to crafting a distinctly English form of epic poetry. The Fairy Queen was conceived as a 12-book epic. However, Spencer completed only six, each book was dedicated to exploring a specific virtue through its principal knight or hero in a mythical realm that mirrored the moral and political landscape of Spencer's England. The first three books, focusing on holiness, temperance, and chastity, were published in the 1590 edition, and the next three, highlighting friendship, justice, and courtesy, appeared in the 1596 edition. This structure was not just a narrative device, but also a moral and ethical compass guiding the readers through the complex labyrinth of Tudor ideologies and the human condition. Central to the poem's charm is the Spenserian stanza, a distinctive verse form invented by Spencer. Each stanza contains nine lines. The first eight are iambic pentameter, and the ninth is an iambic hexameter, known as an alexandrine. This structure with an intricate rhyme scheme of A B A B B C B C C, lends a harmonious and elevated quality to the poem. The Spenserian stanza was a significant contribution to English literature, influencing countless poets in the centuries to follow. To appreciate the artistry, consider these lines from the opening of the poem. A gentle knight was pricking on the plain. He clad in mighty arms and silver shield, wherein old dints of deep wounds did remain, the cruel marks of many a bloody field, yet arms till that time he never wield. These lines exemplify Spencer's use of archaic language, creating a sense of timelessness and grandeur. The rhythm is melodic yet forceful, evoking the gallantry and resilience of the night. The visual imagery, enriched by the mentions of old dints of deep wounds, not only sets a vivid scene but also hints at the knight's experience and the trials ahead. The Fairy Queen, with its rich symbolism and innovative form, represents a monumental achievement in English literature, embodying the spirit of the era and the genius of Edmund Spencer. 
At the heart of the poem's allegorical nature is its representation of Queen Elizabeth I and the Tudor dynasty. Spencer's Gloriana, the Fairy Queen, is more than a fictional sovereign. She epitomizes Elizabeth herself, embodying an ideal portrayal of her reign. Spencer presents Gloriana as a ruler of unparalleled wisdom and grace, a beacon of hope and stability, much as Elizabeth was viewed by her contemporaries. This allegorical depiction extends to the poem's celebration of Elizabeth's policies, her religious stance, and the cultural flourishing under her rule. Furthermore, Spencer's knights represent various virtues, each undertaking quests that symbolize moral and ethical trials relevant to the human experience, especially in the context of Tudor England. The Red Cross Knight, protagonist of the first book, symbolizes holiness. His journey, fraught with challenges and temptations, can be seen as an allegory for the spiritual struggles of a Christian life, reflecting the religious turmoil of Spencer's time. Sir Guion, the Knight of Temperance in the second book, faces temptations of excess, his adventures echoing the calls for moderation and restraint in an era of opulence and conquest. The allegorical representation of chastity through Bridomart, a female knight, in the third book is particularly striking. Bridomart is not just a symbol of purity, but also represents the strength and virtue of women, a nod to the reigning Queen Elizabeth. Her martial prowess and independence stand as a testament to the changing perceptions of women's roles in a patriarchal society. Additionally, Spencer's use of symbolism is profound. The monsters and the villains the knights encounter, such as the deceitful sorcerer Archimago or the grotesque Error, are embodiments of moral vices and corrupt practices. These encounters illustrate the constant battle between good and evil, a theme deeply ingrained in the moral fabric of the 16th century. In The Fairy Queen, Spencer not only crafts a fantastical world of knights and dragons, but also constructs a mirror reflecting the complexities of his own society. The poem is a rich allegorical journey through virtues and vices, triumphs and trials that defined Tudor England. Its enduring appeal lies in its ability to intertwine these grand allegories with timeless human experiences, making it a seminal work in the canon of English literature. Edmund Spencer was living through these turbulent times and infused his epic poem with reflections and critiques of his contemporary society, particularly the reign of Elizabeth and the complexities of English rule in Ireland. Spencer's representation of the religious atmosphere of his time is particularly evident in the moral and spiritual quests of the knights. The conflict between Protestantism and Catholicism, a central theme of Elizabethan politics, is woven throughout the narrative. The Red Cross Knight's battle against the dragon error can be interpreted as a metaphor for the struggle against religious misinformation, echoing the Protestant Reformation's emphasis on personal faith and the interpretation of scripture. Spencer's allegorical treatment of these religious themes reflects the era's contentious religious debates and the Elizabethan establishment's efforts to assert Protestant dominance. The poem's intricate relationship with the Elizabethan court is another facet of its political commentary. Spencer's glorification of Queen Elizabeth as Gloriana, the idealized virtues she embodies, underscores his support for the Tudor monarchy. However, this portrayal is not merely sycophantic. It is a nuanced exploration of the ideals and challenges of governance. The virtues represented by the knights, holiness, temperance, chastity, and so on, are not just personal qualities, but political ideals, reflecting the qualities that Spencer deemed essential for effective and just rule in his contemporary society. Furthermore, Spencer's experiences in Ireland deeply infused his work. His depiction of the wild, untamed landscapes in The Fairy Queen can be seen as an allegorical representation of the Irish territories, which were viewed by many English contemporaries as savage and in need of civilizing. This perspective is more explicitly expressed in his prose work, A View of the Present State of Ireland, where he advocates for harsh measures to subdue the Irish rebellions. These views seep into the fabric of the Fairy Queen, where battles against disorderly and chaotic forces can be interpreted as echoing the English efforts to impose order in Ireland. Talking about the Spenserian stanza, which, of course, was not just the hallmark of the Fairy Queen, it became a tool for later poets who found in it a perfect blend of lyrical beauty and narrative depth. 
poets like Lord Byron in Child Harold's Pilgrimage and Keats in The Eve of St. Agnes employed the Spenserian stanza, paying homage to Spencer's stylistic innovations. His influence also extended to the Romantic poets who admired his rich descriptions of nature, his exploration of complex emotional states, and his melding of the medieval with the modern. Spencer's impact on the English language and its poetic tradition is profound. His deliberate use of archaic language and his efforts to emulate earlier poets like Chaucer lent English poetry a dignity and gravity that it had not possessed before. He enriched the language with new words and phrases, and his works became a reservoir from which future writers drew inspiration. Spencer's intricate allegories and symbolic narratives also helped to elevate poetry as a medium for philosophical and moral exploration, setting a precedent for English epic poetry. One of the most fascinating aspects of Spencer's legacy is his interaction with contemporaries, notably Sir Walter Raleigh. Raleigh, of course, was a prominent figure in Elizabeth's court and an adventurer and someone we did an episode on like a month ago. He was not only a patron, but a close friend to Spencer. Legend has it that it was Raleigh who, recognizing the genius in the unpublished parts of the Fairy Queen, encouraged Spencer to travel to London and present the poem to Queen Elizabeth directly. This meeting led to Spencer receiving a pension from the Queen, a testament to his impact and standing in the Elizabethan court. As we reflect on the extraordinary life and work of Edmund Spencer, it's clear that his legacy is one of enduring influence and remarkable depth. Spencer's The Fairy Queen stands not just as a monument of English literature, but as a beacon of the richness of the English language and its capabilities. His inventive use of narrative, allegory, and symbolism makes his work perpetually compelling. It's the blend of fantastical storytelling with profound insights into human nature and societal constructs that makes Spencer's work timeless and continually relevant. The beauty of his language, the complexity of his characters, and the vividness of his imagined world invite readers into a realm where poetry and philosophy intertwine seamlessly. So we will leave it there, and I think we should all go take a break and read some Spencer. What do you think? Should we do that right now? Let's just do that. Let's just take five minutes. I'll stick some links in the show notes so you can just go start reading right now. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. Again, if you want to join Patreon or the YouTube channel and get extra content, that would be amazing. Patreon.com slash Englandcast or just click the join this channel button on YouTube if you are listening to this on YouTube. All right, my friends, thank you so very, very much uh, for listening. I will be back again in a week or so. Have a good one. Bye bye. Blow. Send for baby sweetie.